Tonight's message is from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 10. And we have titled it Faith and Confession. This is the third part of that series. It's basically Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. And uh, tonight we'll be studying verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Tonight's study will be mainly an emphasis on the meaning of saving faith. Many profess to have Christian faith, but do we truly have that faith? Is it biblical faith? Is it saving faith? And that is the biggest question that we as Christians need to ask ourselves, because not all who call themselves believers are counted as believers by the Lord. Now, Jesus made this very clear in his narration of the events of Judgment Day. Because our Lord is the Alpha and Omega. He knows the end from the beginning. And in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, Jesus speaks these very sobering words. And he says, not all who call upon me and say, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. But those who do the will of my Father in heaven. Uh, Jesus could not have made it clearer, right? And then he goes on to tell us that on the day of judgment, there will be many. Again, look at the number. It's not a few. He says, there will be many who say, Lord, but did we not cast out demons in your name and do signs and miracles and preach in your name? I mean, they will be surprised that Jesus uh, refuses to know or recognize them at all. And then they will ask him, uh, did we not do all of this in your name? And Jesus will say, and then the Lord says that on that day, I will say to these people, go away from me, you sinners. I knew you not. These are sobering words. Why did he not know them? Why did he not recognize what they were doing? Because even though they were doing it in his name, the Lord was not with them because they were sinning. And they were using the name of God as merchandise. And there's a coming a time of judgment when everything will be exposed for what it really is. Beloved, this is not a time to play games. We have to get very serious in our walk with the Lord. Are you really serious? Do you know who you believe? Paul emphatically makes the statement I say in, and he says that I know whom I have believed. This is emphatic. This is so profound. He professes to know exactly who he believes. He has a living relationship with the living God. He had a living relationship, an ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ. And he knew whom he served. Hallelujah. In his famous words in the book of Acts, where he relates to the people in the ship, the captors with him. And he says, um, an angel of the Lord, whose I am and whom I serve. And these are beautiful words, right? For a Christian who is dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ. An angel of the Lord, whose I am and whom I serve. So Paul knew clearly whose he was and whom he served. Are we clear? Does he recognize us? Do we have that assurance in us? Because the first letter, the epistle of John, talks about this. It says, those who are his have a knowledge, have a knowing within themselves. They know that God knows them. Do you have that assurance, beloved? And here it says, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. So the decision to believe in Jesus, to follow him, because again, uh, let me just clarify the word believe. It's the word pistewo in the Greek. And this uh, word had diverse meanings. And some of them are to trust in, to follow, to completely rely upon. And so when Paul was using this word, and this has been used uh, not just exclusively by Paul, but throughout the Gospels, throughout the New Testament, the word pisteo, as in, uh, you know, believe. And the connotation of this word was 
to trust him, to follow. And that means one who is a true disciple of Jesus Christ. So the word believe, pisteo, entailed all of these uh, various meanings. It was one who had made a decision from the heart to accept Jesus Christ as his personal Lord. And this is a decision that every individual has to make. No matter how, you love, how much you love a person, you cannot make the decision for them. No matter how you, much you want them to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you can never, ever make that decision for them. You can pray to the Lord to give them the grace to come and hunger for him, to, you know, to search after him. Because unless the Lord draws a person to him, Jesus made it very clear in, his, in the gospel of John that no one comes to me except the Father draw him. And therefore, we need to pray for our beloved uh, who are not saved, who are not in the Lord, who are not born of water and of spirit. Beloved, those who are not born of water and spirit will not enter the kingdom of God. Jesus made it very clear to Nicodemus. And he, by the way, was a member of the Sanhedrin, the you know, Jewish religious council that even has cropped, it, uh, cropped up again in our times. And in Jesus' times, uh, this Sanhedrin made all the religious decisions. They were the governing body. Um, and they made very important decisions regarding the, the welfare of, you know, the people as well. So they were, uh, you know, even though they were a religious uh, body, but they were also responsible for a lot of political decisions regarding the Jews as a whole. Now, what we need to know is he was a part of this, and to be a part of the Sanhedrin, he had to know the scriptures in and out. He had to know the Torah in and out. He had to know the Tanakh or the, you know, Old Testament as we know it now, um, through and through. So he had to know what were in the five, first five books uh, that were written by Moses, Genesis to Deuteronomy. He had to know what were written in the, you know, Ketubim or the holy writings, which includes everything else uh, apart from, you know, the first five books, the Torah and the books written by the prophets called the Nebi'im. And so, you know, the prophetic books were called Nebi'im. And then the rest of the writings were called the holy writings, which includes the Psalms, Proverbs, Songs of Songs, the book of Job, and the historical books or the books that chronicle the history of Israel, the books, uh, books such as Joshua, Ruth, and so on and so forth. And so he, he had to be well-versed in these. And was Jesus talking about a new concept here? No. In Ezekiel chapter 36, and also in Jeremiah chapter 31, the Lord had pronounced through his prophets that he would make a final covenant with his people Israel, in which the law would not just be you know, on their minds, but the Lord would write the law, his law, in their hearts, and that they would keep his law. And in Ezekiel, he makes it very clear what he intended to do under this new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ. And in Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 36, mark this, verses 25, 26, and 27. The Lord had declared through his prophet Ezekiel the con content of the new covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ. He said in verse 25, he said, I will, uh, I will sprinkle them with water, referring to the word. Because the water is a reference to the word of God, which is Jesus Christ. And that we find in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 26, through the washing of the water, which is the word. <clears throat> and so the Lord says, and I'll sprinkle the water upon them, and I'll pur purify you from all of your iniquities and your idolatry. Because Israel was infamous for their idolatry. I mean, just read the prophetic books. Read the book of Kings and Samuel, and you'll find how they fell into idolatry. Solomon himself, whom God had given such wisdom that there was none like him before or after, um, fell into this sin. And in fact, the first two commandments talk about this. The Lord says, thou shalt not have any other gods beside me. And the next is, you shall not make an idol or worship or bow before an idol. And so uh, because of this apostasy, the judgment of God came upon them. And so um, we find that 
In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 25, the Lord says, I will cleanse your heart of all of your idolatry. Now in verse 26, it says, and I'll give you a new heart. So what does God promise to change in the new birth? He promises to change the heart. Now, why is it so important to change the heart? If you go back to scripture again, the book of Proverbs, which is the book of wisdom, we find in the fourth chapter, the 23rd verse, that uh, the word of God through Solomon um, warns us to guard our hearts above all else because, and then he gives us the reason, says, because out of it come the issues of life. Everything pertaining to life proceeds from the heart. Jesus, our Lord, confirms this in the Gospels when he says, uh, and when, you know, the, the legalistic Jews um, criticize him um, and <clears throat> his, his criticize him for not, for, for not insisting upon his disciples to wash ritually. And this was not anywhere in the Torah or the law. But this was a later tradition added on by the rabbis called the Mishnah. It's called Mishnah means second in Hebrew. And so it was ritualistic cleansing of the, you know, pots and pans and a lot of other utensils and, you know, washing of hands in a certain way where they would, they would not allow the, the, the water to come back to the hands and they would hold up the hands like this and it would flow down their uh, forearm, down their uh, elbow and so and they were not supposed to you know turn it back uh, that was ritualistic ritualistic cleansing and when they saw his disciples just taking taking the kernels of the grain and eating them um, they criticized jesus for allowing them to eat without ritually cleansing themselves first washing them so that is what they were referring to man-made traditions not the law and uh, Jesus said it is not what goes into the mouth that uh, you know desecrates the person, but it's what comes out of them. And then he begins to explain that adultery, fornication, and murders, all of this comes out from the human heart. Beloved, um, our heart was corrupted the day Adam and Eve took off that fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and ate of it. And their eyes were opened towards evil. Their heart was corrupted by evil. And in Genesis 6, we find these, you know, heart-wrenching words where the word of God tells us what was going on in the heart of God. When he saw the minds of men, the imaginations of their heart was evil con constantly, not even periodically, but constantly evil, inclined, to, inclined towards evil. And we see this uh, result of death, this um, repercussion of the fall in the Garden of Eden, the disobedience, the transgression, the sin that took place in the Garden of Eden. And the corruption of the heart of humanity is a result of that first act of disobedience. In fact, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, verse 9, tells us the state of every fallen human being born of a woman. And it says, the heart is wicked above everything else, desperately wicked. That's how wicked our heart is, beloved. You cannot rely upon your heart unless God changes it. And under the new covenant in Ezekiel, the Lord makes it clear that he is going to give those who believe in his son, Jesus Christ, a new heart. And then he goes on to describe that this new heart would be like a heart of flesh. And he would take away the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Now, what is this? The heart of stone is symbolic for a heart that is not responsive to the love of God. A heart that will not obey even though they know the will and the word of God. A heart that is not willing to submit to the authority of God. A heart that is not willing to repent of their sins even though they know it's evil. And therefore, a heart of stone is a reference to such a state of the heart. That is at total, you know, loggerheads with the will of God, totally opposed to the person and will of Jesus Christ. And the Lord says, once a person believes in Jesus Christ with their heart, I'll give them a new heart. I'll give them a heart of flesh. And what is this heart of flesh? 
a heart that is willing to do the will of God, a heart that is hungry to know the will of God. And those who have experienced the new birth will know what I'm talking about. If you are a person that has not experienced the new birth in Christ, that has not received the Holy Spirit, please listen carefully. But for those who have experienced this, you will know how God changed your heart, how you, after the Lord, you know, after you received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you were given a new heart, a heart that desired to do his will, a heart that wanted to repent of sin, a heart that wanted to be pure for the one who had purchased you with his precious blood on the cross, shed on the cross 2,000 years ago. And so that is the heart of flesh, beloved, a heart that longs to know him, a heart that longs to do his will. And so it's not a burden to do the will of God. The commandments of God are no more a burden for the soul because a new heart that God has given to the one who believes in his son, Jesus Christ, enables them, in fact, makes them passionate to know the will and the ways of God through his word. And that is the work of the Holy Spirit, beloved. And then he says, and I'll give you a new spirit. I'll put my spirit within you. Hallelujah. So there are two things that are changed in the new birth. Number one, the Lord gives the believer a new heart, a heart of flesh that is now willing to submit to the will of God and does not want to have its own way. A heart that says, have thine own way, Lord. Not my will, but yours be done, as Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And that is the heart of flesh that God has given to one who believes, sincerely believes in Jesus Christ, who is willing to follow Jesus for the rest of his life. Because faith, this terror, is a commitment to follow. One who follows, yes and trusts, to trust and obey him. As the songwriter says, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. How simple and how profound at the same time. And then the Lord says in the 27th verse, after he has sprinkled them with the word, after they have received the word of God, the gospel, and God cleanses them, he'll give them a new heart, and he'll give them his spirit, the Holy Spirit, to dwell inside of their spirit. And so they're dead spirits because the pers per every person's spirit is there, but it's been cut off from the creator. God is spirit. John chapter 4, verse 24. And so when a person is sins, they are cut off from their creator. Every connection from God is cut off. And that is explained in the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, verse 2, where it says, uh, makes this uh, you know, statement, where it says, for you have been cut off from God by, because of your transgressions. We have been separated from God because of our transgressions. And Psalm 58, verse 3 says, a sinner is separated from God right from the womb. And David, King David refers to this truth in his psalm of repentance in Psalm 51, verse 5, where he says, for I was, you know, born in, in iniquity. I was birthed in iniqui iniquity. It was conceived in iniquity. And so he's referring to the fact that he was a sinner right from uh, the time he was conceived in his mother's womb. And that is the state of every human being that is born of Adam, a descendant of Adam. But this is the good news, beloved. There's a way out of it. And the only way out of this dilemma is Jesus Christ. If a person believes with his heart, all of his heart, and that's why Proverbs says, you know, above all else, guard your heart. And, and, and that's why, again, in the book of Proverbs, it says, my son, give me your heart. And that's why it says, when you search for me with all of your heart, in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13, you will find me. And so this decision to follow Jesus Christ, to believe in him, has to be made with our hearts. Yes, our intellect does play a role in understanding the gospel message. Comprehension does play a role. But ultimately, the decision is made from our hearts. Whether we want Jesus to be the Lord of our lives, 
to commit our lives for the rest of our stay here on earth and for eternity with him. Do you want to make the decision? Beloved, if you are hearing this gospel message for the first time, I want to invite you to surrender your life to Jesus Christ because there's only one way to God. There's only one way to heaven. Every other way leads to hell, H-E-L-L. -L. It's a place of eternal torment where the fire burns their spiritual bodies and they cry out, where the worms gnaw at their marrow and they gnash their teeth. Beloved, it was, it was not a place created by God for humanity. It was a place created for Satan and his rebellious angelic host that rebelled against God, their creator. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41 states this truth. Beloved, but because of the disobedience of the first humans that God created in his image, Adam and Eve, because they took up the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil that God had forbade them to eat and shown them and told them the consequence of eating and disobeying him. And he said, the day you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. And because of that, humanity has been subject to Satan and to sin. But Jesus came 2,000 years ago to pay for your sins and my sins. And he died on the cross, and that was the penalty for our sins. For the wages of sin, Romans 6.23 tells us, is death. And Jesus died that hor horrific death on the cross. A recent movie made by Mel Gibson called The Passion of Christ attempts to portray the horrifying nature of the, the beatings that Jesus underwent before he was even crucified. Do you know why that happened, beloved? Because he loved you. Do you know why he went to the cross to die for your sins and my sins? Because he loved you. John 3.16 tells us this truth. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, referring to Jesus Christ, that whosoever believeth in him, and I've explained the word believe, commits to follow him, relies upon him, to meet all their needs. Pays allegiance to him. To be faithful and to serve him and him alone. That they might have eternal life. That they should not perish. But have eternal life. Hallelujah. So if you want to receive Jesus Christ. As your Lord and Savior. Please repeat this prayer with me. With all of your heart. And pray thus. Lord. I am a sinner. I have sinned against you, and the penalty of my sins is death. Lord, I repent of my sins, and I commit my life into your hands. Jesus, be Lord of my life. Lead me. Guide me. I commit my entire life into your loving care. I will serve no other master. I will bow before no other king, and I dedicate my life into your loving care. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have sincerely prayed this prayer with all of your heart, as the word says, then God has declared you righteous in his sight. He has forgiven you your sins, no matter how ugly they were, no matter how prominent they might have been, because the blood of Jesus can wash away every sin. And if, if you have truly received Jesus as your Lord, then his Holy Spirit will come inside of you and he'll dwell within you and lead you into the path of righteousness. May God bless the sharing of his word.